Right, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. It's Dr. John Curry, who attended the Cornell University prior to starting his medical degree at Thomason Jefferson Hospital. Dr. Curry remained at Thomas and Jefferson University Hospital, where he completed his internship in internal medicine and was then chief resident in neurology. He won multiple awards while there, including awards for teaching and stroke research. Dr. Curry completed his fellowship in sleep medicine as the chief fellow and is the only practicing neurologist in this area, Philadelphia, who is both dual based certified in neurology and sleep medicine. He currently serves as the associate director of the Abingdon Memorial Hospital Sleep Disorders Center. And he's here today to talk about optimizing your medical journey. Thank you. Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, guys. Okay. Well, thank everyone for coming out today. Uh, today uh, is a little bit of a less of a scientific talk that I'm used to giving, but uh, hopefully you'll, you'll help me through this. I'm here to help you optimize your journey through your healthcare. I'm here to help you figure out the best way to get what you need from your physicians and from your general health in general. All right, so these are my disclosures. I do consulting for numerous pharmaceutical companies, speakers, bureaus, and I have research with uh, just about the same companies that I consult with. Uh, and I don't think there should be any issues with that today, but if there is, you can certainly ask me about it. The plan for today is to go over my background, understand why I became a sleep doctor, uh, choose your, how to choose your doctor, how to get the most out of your visits, how to get the most from your care, and then how you can help sleep for yourself and, and for the sleep society in the future. So this is how I got here. This is a picture of my dad. Uh, as you can see, not all of my photos of my dad are like this. Uh, and if he saw me take this photo of him, he would be not too happy. But this, this is how I grew up. This, this, this is how I grew up. I grew up with a person who was hypersomnolent and who continues to be hypersomnolent. So this is how I really got interested in sleep at a very, very young age. People ask me all the time, Dr. Corey or John, how did you, how did you get into sleep? And it, it is this gentleman right here. Um, I will tell you one of the earliest memories I have of my, with my dad when I was about seven or eight years old. He took me to a park called Dorney Park, if you know it, in the Allentown area. And we were getting in line for what I think was the Hercules roller coaster. And as he was going through the turnstiles, he put his two arms on the side and literally just fell asleep. Just like that, as we were walking in line on the way to a roller coaster. Uh, my dad has gone through many, many different sleep doctors and has gone through ups and downs, which is kind of why I try to take a look at uh, my patients through his lens. And I know the, many of the mistakes that he's made, uh, and I'm hoping you won't make some of those same mistakes. So that's just a, a simple story uh, of how I got here. So how you should be picking your doctor. Um, a first thing to do is always start with your primary care doctor because open communication is key between your primary care doctor and between your specialist. If your primary care doctor is not very familiar with a specialist or vice versa, sometimes there's some communication breakdown. So optimally speaking, you'll talk to your primary doctor about patients or about physicians who they refer to. And this is probably the, your best and first source, especially if you're a primary doctor and you have a very good relationship and have been around uh, for a while. Always check for board certification. This can be done online. Of course, if you have a very young doctor who's one or two years out, the boards are only done every few years, so there, there may be a lag in the board certification uh, with about a year or two, but ch always check for board certification. Online reviews is about a mix. Um, you can see some great things about doctors. You can see some awful things about physicians as well. Um, many of the large healthcare systems right now have found out ways to basically bulk spam uh, good reviews. So everybody looks like they have a good review when they belong to certain major hospital systems. So just be aware of that. And so this can be very tricky. I think they used to be good and now they've been manipulated enough that it, it, everything kind of looks the same. My best piece of advice from this slide is to ask the medical secretaries. If you want to know the best person to ask, it is always ask the clinical workers who are there and in the front lines, ask the best medical secretaries. And I discovered this by accident. When my, my wife got pregnant in the area, we were looking for an OBGYN. She didn't know who to ask. We were somewhat new. I just called the hospital where she was planning to deliver, and I called a random nurse's station. I said, do you guys have a doctor you would recommend? And they gave us a great OBGYN. So I will tell you the nurses, uh, medical staff, secretaries, usually the first person to pick up will be the person to give you the best advice. And don't be afraid to ask for the type of physician that you want. Maybe you want a physician who is uh, more strict. Maybe you want a physician who is less strict with their rules. So you have to kind of find that in, in advance. And if you know that in advance, you'll get a good doctor-patient uh, visit. 
So I did some research before this talk on how are doctors different than the general population. And this will, I think, give you some uh, uh, insight, especially as I talk later. Doctors are more likely to be agreeable with patients. That's good. They're more likely to be conscientious. They're more likely to be extroverted, which I was very surprised about. I feel like most doctors I know are somewhat introverted, but they're also much more likely to be neurotic than you are, okay? And if you're already neurotic and think of you getting a doctor who is more neurotic than you, that might make, not might make for a good scenario. So just be, very, be aware of that. These are some of the traits that are there. Doctors, however, are less open than their physician, or than their patients. And that is also somewhat surprising. And so this is somehow, this is uh, what can cause a disconnect between patients and physicians. When a doctor tells you to do something, and they believe they know the good reasons why, but they're not quite open in telling you, well, why did my doctor tell me to do this? If you don't ask, their intuition is not to be open about it. Their intuition is to, I know, and the patient probably knows because they read it online somewhere, so that maybe they don't do a good job of explaining themselves as to why they've made a decision for you. So doctors are less likely to be open than you are, and this is not surprising, uh, especially when uh, patients are crammed into uh, large volume systems where you've got to be seen 20 patients a day. Doctor has to make decisions quickly and may not have a lot of time to give this information to you. So I want you to use your time well when you're in the office, and that's where we'll get to next. Doctors may be in a large practice in a large hospital system. Doctors may be in small practices. There are certainly pros and cons to each. Large health systems, you have great electronic medical record systems. You have easy access to your data on, 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 a, on a handheld phone. Uh, provider longevity tends to be more prevalent in smaller systems. Large systems, you may see providers come and go more often. Uh, they give great contracts, and then when those contracts wear out, doctors may sometimes leave. Uh, it's sometimes hard to get a specific person in a large healthcare system. You may be lost in a phone tree, and that can be very difficult. But a large healthcare system, they usually have everything you need somewhere if you can get to it. Hospitals also may uh, have higher billing costs to your insurance. It may be cheaper for you or your insurance not going through large hospital systems, but that is very much patient individual and hospital individual as well, and will base on your zip code. So prior to your visit with your doctor, do all requested paperwork in advance. This is probably the, one of the number one pet peeves when I've sp uh, spoken to doctors about this. When paperwork's not done, the patient comes, and now the doctor has to use their time to get information that they wanted before your visit so it's harder for them to prepare for their time with you. If you have a complicated medical history, write it down, have it in list format, and I'll show you that in the next slide. Have your medication list. Make sure it is on you at all times. You have easy access to it, not on page 20 somewhere where you have to log in for a while. Have it available. And one of the things that is really hard for physicians to find is your previous medication list. Medications you are not actively on today, but medications you may have been on in the past. In most electronic medical record systems, it is very difficult to find. So your doctor may not know what you've been on, and you may forget what you've been on in the past. And this can uh, lead to a lot of wasted time. If you don't know you've been on a medication, and then your doctor prescribes you, say, Adderall, and then you get to the pharmacy and your pharmacist says, oh, no, you took this drug five years ago. Now you've got to go back and make another decision and you've lost some time, you've lost valuable time in that limited uh, expectation. Uh, set your expectations for what's going to happen in your doctor's visit. Again, this is a great place to get uh, from the secretary or the medical scheduler. Ask them how long your visit is going to be for. Is your visit an hour visit? Is it a 15, 20 minute visit? That way you can try to figure out what you need to present in advance. I always tell patients to keep a sleep diary. I think physicians sometimes forget to do this and forget to remind patients to do this, but I ask all my patients to keep a sleep diary, even if it's for just two weeks between visits, just so we get a general idea of when sleep time is, when wake up time is, when patients are most tired, when are they napping, and this will help uh, improve your, your next follow-up visit. Probably if you took one piece of advice out of here, it would be this last bullet point. Make sure you have copies of all your old sleep studies. If you put them in a safe deposit box or something like that, it's that important. It is, it is essentially worth gold. The reason that is is 
Your insurance companies require copies of these studies to get your medications. I can't tell you how many times my dad lost copies of his sleep studies. I can't tell you how many times the hospital lost copies of his sleep studies. And if you switch between medical systems and sleep centers have been known to close down, especially in some parts of the country, Sometimes it's incredibly difficult to get a copy of those studies, and we've had to repeat sleep studies for patients who were previously diagnosed with narcolepsy or previously diagnosed with hypersomnia, and they are unable uh, to get old copies. And if you, were, if you know if you've gone through that test, you're not guaranteed to get the same result every time. Uh, depending on the sleep study, depending on the lab, depending on your mood that day, you might have difficulty falling asleep, and you may need to do the study a third time. So have copies of your sleep studies. Don't rely on electronic medical record systems. Don't rely on hospitals to keep it for you. Have a printed paper copy of your sleep study in a safe deposit box, a drawer in your house, somewhere where you can keep a copy of this. This, I think, is probably one of my dad's biggest mistakes, especially going through a few different hospital systems. Things to have on your own personal health summary sheet, especially if you're traveling between physicians, a list of all medical diagnoses you've been worked up for or that you are being worked up for. If you've had any surgeries, a list of those. Most importantly, in, in social history, smoking, alcohol, caffeine, marijuana. Most people won't write down if they're taking drugs, but you do need to be honest with your doctor if you are. Lifestyle and job hours may or may not be relevant. Certainly, if you have a normal office job, nine to five, not that important to write down. But if you're a shift worker, incredibly important to write down. Uh, if you are work unusual hours or you have to, big gaps in your day where you can take a break, that's good for your doctor to know so they can help work with you. Current medication list with dose and that previous medication list with dose. If you can get your previous medications and have a list, the dose you took it at, the reason you stopped it, you will be able to save both you and your physician tremendous amounts of time. Important to know family history, getting what a first degree relative has been diagnosed with is most important. Second and third degree relatives, not so much. And again, the importance of having your sleep studies on hand at all times. On the day of your visit, arrive 20 to 30 minutes early. Your doctors tell you to do this, uh, and you may think of it as just something that you're, they're supposed to say, but your doctors really appreciate it when you can come early to the visit. If a patient is early and there's a no-show, I will pluck them right from the waiting room and get them, uh, get them through. Prior to your visit, have exactly in mind what it is you want to talk about and what is specific to your problem and what you want to accomplish that day. If you could accomplish one thing on that visit, what would it be? Have that in your mind before you walk out. If you have questions, write them down in advance because the second you walk out of the doctor's office, you're going to think of two or three. Scales that you might fill out, you're probably, how many of you have filled out the airport sleepiness score and how many times have you filled it out? Hundreds of times for sure. Uh, most of us will ask it on every single visit. If you have the opportunity to, ask your physician for a second copy of the, sleep, of the Epworth and hand it to your spouse if they're coming with you. Take a look at your score and take a look at what your spouse would score you as. And I will often notice a big difference between the patient's self-reported sleepiness and the spouse's uh, self-reported sleepiness. Less common scores are the fatigue severity scale score, the uh, idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale score, which is used more in research, and the Swiss narcolepsy scale. What is your most bothersome issue? Think about that as you walk into your visit. You want to address that. That's the key thing for your appointment. Are you too tired in the morning, early afternoon? Are you falling asleep too early in the evenings? Are you, can you not get out of bed in the mornings? Do you have trouble falling asleep? Are you having cataplexy that's too much to deal with? Are you napping? Is it your work that is causing you to have problems? You want to make sure that you can have this piece of information in advance so you can tell your doctor and your doctor can work with you to figure out what the best thing is. Also, again, I, I stress, ask your family members what the most bothersome issue is. Don't ask your, your employees or, or your people who you work with, but ask your family what the most bothersome issue is. What is it that they want from you that you can participate in normal family life. And uh, there, I know there is a lot of back and forth between spouses and patients when it comes to what's best for the patient themselves. Ultimately, it falls on what's best for the patient, but the patient is, does not live in isolation. The patient lives with family. The patient has a society that, inter that interacts with them. So I often will stress to patients, talk to your spouse, talk to your kids, talk to your parents. What is it that they see in you that was better at one point or is now worse, and what, how can that be corrected? A lot of times, patients tend to isolate themselves from family members, and I think that tends to lead to poor prognosis in the long run.
Be kind to your office staff. I have heard from many of my uh, front desk workers that a patient is incredibly mean to them up front and then incredibly nice to the physician. So we know about this when this sort of thing happens. You want to make sure when you're at the front desk to be polite to them. They work very hard, sometimes even harder than the physicians to make sure you get your uh, appointment uh, melt, dealt with. They're the ones dealing with the insurance companies on your behalf, and that is incredibly burdensome to deal with. Uh, and they are the ones that have to deal with every single thing that comes through that front door, whether it be good, bad, or ugly. As I said earlier, start off with your most bothersome symptoms, start off with your most bothersome issue. If you have two things that you want to address with your physician, or there's two major things, put those two things out in the first sentence when you speak to your physician. Doctor, there's two things I want to talk to you about. Number one is the fact that I am napping inconsolably in the middle of the afternoon, and number two, at night I'm having problems falling asleep. You want to put those up front so your doctor can framework the rest of what you say. If you only say one thing and then your, doc your visit is three quarters of the way over and you say, oh, but, oh, but, you've already moved through most of the time and you're not giving your physician an opportunity to address all your issues fairly. They'll be able to balance between the two if you put them up front. Open honesty is key. One of the most important things to be told about is if you are skipping or missing medications. Your doctor needs to know that, especially if your sleepiness levels are higher than they normally are. Are you missing doses? Are you forgetting? And why is that? And what can we do to prevent that, respect that? Uh, respect your clock. Respect your biological clock. If you, have, uh, if you know you're somebody that needs eight to nine hours of sleep or even 10, make sure that you get that. Um, respect the clock for your physician too. If your physician has a 30 to 40 minute appointment for you and you are not able to address everything in that time, just ask to make another appointment. Most physicians have absolutely no problem with multiple appointments. They want to get to all your issues, but when there are 10 patients in the waiting room and five phone calls behind them, they start to feel stressed. They start to get antsy and you don't want them addressing your medical issues at the point of the visit when they're the most antsiest, which is at the end. You want to get that all done in the beginning. Show up. Your doctor will know if you've missed a visit because many doctors go to the chart before you show up and they look through your medical records and they put work in and then when a patient misses their visit, not only did they take the opportunity of another patient, but they wasted the clinician's time who was doing work on that patient's behalf and now that time is essentially gone. So make sure to show up. If you can't show up, call that morning. Uh, most of us are very, very forgiving with that. Ask questions. One of the things I noticed with telemedicine now, I see lots of patients bring, using their notepads and they're writing down what we say. In fact, I notice it more in a telemedicine visit than I do when I'm a, in a clinical visit and the patient's physically in the office with me. Patients are taking a lot more notes in telemedicine and it might be the fact that they're sitting comfortably at their desk and they've just got a very good setup for that. So bring a notepad with you. Don't write down everything that the physician says, but keep the highlights there. We forget, as human beings, we forget. The third time is usually the charm for memory. You need to be told things two or three times in order for it to keep away in your long-term memory. So again, don't, feel, don't be afraid to ask questions or don't be afraid for clarification. Or if you ask the same question two or three visits in a row, it's completely fine. We're used to answering the same questions over and over again every single day. In the late 90s or so, the physician decision-making changed from that of one of autonomy to that of shared decision-making. So there used to be a very paternalistic view with medicine. Doctor says this, must do this, and that's the way it is. Uh, doctors are not emperors. Doctors will give you options. Ask for any options that you have available. If you don't like the options that you hear, um, see, talk to your doctor, explain what it is you don't like. That might help cue your doctor as to what they can do for you. Rely on your doctor's experience in the field. Ask your doctor, in this situation, what have you done before? What have your other patients done who have been like me? I think that's a great question to ask. In advance, know what side effects you're willing to tolerate when your doctor tells you about them and what side effects are completely unacceptable to you. You'll, if you know this in advance, your doctor will be able to make a good decision for you at the time. And explain why you can or cannot adhere to a medication regimen. Don't try to over-impress your doctor. If he gives you a very complicated regimen and you think, oh, I can do this, and then you tell him you can do it, but you cannot, it's not going to work out for you. So make sure that you are listening to them and you're telling them what you are taking and not able to take. Set goals for your work and for school and for your family life, and that way you can create a medication regimen that's, that's right for you. 
Phone calls, I figure this is good to address because many patients call the office. When's a good time to call the office? Call if you have intolerable side effects. Call if there's something completely unexpected. We want to hear from you. If you're concerned if you're taking the medication correctly or incorrectly, especially if it's a new start, we want to know. So call us for that. Don't call us if you want to make a routine change to your medication. That's what a visit is for, especially if it's something you've been on for a long time. Or if you need a higher dose of medicine, usually we want to know why that is the case. So come for a visit to discuss those. If you're leaving a message, be specific, and, be, and this is most important for your secretary, especially in electronic medical record systems. They have click boxes they have to check to direct the message in the correct buckets that your doctors have. Is this a medication question? Is this a medication? Is this a question about adherence? Is this a question about your appointment? All these things you don't see from the front end, but all these things have to get dealt with on the back end. So if you're leaving a voicemail, be very specific as to the reason for that voicemail. And many times we can give you a very easy answer right off the bat, even uh, uh, within 10 or 15 minutes if we can get a voicemail with, with specific questions. When you wrap up your visit, when you start a new medication or you're making a lot of changes, talk with your physician about how you want to follow up. Any new medication change or any new uh, major medication dosage should be addressed with some sort of follow-up. Ask your doctor if he, wants, he or she wants you to call or if they want you to make an early appointment, maybe you're used to getting appointments every six months, maybe you come once every four. With a new medication change, you may want to shorten that to four weeks, six weeks, something like that. Um, ask your doctor before you leave the office when to make that next follow-up visit and ask your doctor if it's appropriate to make an earlier visit than normal. That you are more than your medical records. There are stacks of sheets here. This has all been converted now into a computer. Your doctor can sometimes not find this single sheet of paper in, in a huge stack. So coming to your doctor regularly will help remind them of the person that you are more than just this big computer or stack of medical records. After your visit, review your notes that you've written down. Also in an electronic medical record system, review your doctor's notes. Now. Uh, there were new laws passed about two years ago. Physician, uh, patients have access to all their clinician notes. You want to make sure they're correct. I have been corrected on medical typos that I've had, I, I, especially major ones where a patient has said, uh, I, they said yes to a question when I clicked the no. So that's a, it's important to have those things because these records will persist with you forever. So have your patient, have, if you're a patient, check your medical record, usually within about a week or so from your, from your doctor's visit. This will help consistency throughout the, the rest of your healthcare career. Um, and that way, if a, pa if a physician makes a mistake or a typo, it can be addressed uh, immediately. Small typos you don't need to point out. There's tons of those. Your doc doctor is not writing, um, you know, war and peace, but they are, they are meant to get to your issues. If you have issues with your office, do not bring them up first thing. If you have issues, and the reason this is, is patients get agitated when they start to bring up issues that they have with the office. You've all had issues with your office, I know. Um, it, if you want to bring it up, which you should, Bring it up at the end of the visit. If you are agitated as soon as you start this visit because you're talking about a bad experience, it sets the tone for the rest of your 30-minute appointment. Go through your visit with your doctor. Talk about your health. At the end of the visit, doctor, I had a real bad experience with your secretary up front. Doctor, I had an issue getting to the, through the phone tree. Those are the things that should be addressed at the end. They only take a minute. Your doctor has probably heard some of these things before and they really want to make changes with them. Sometimes it's easier to do than others depending on the healthcare system that we're in. Always be specific about the issue and always be polite about it. If you, if you, if you resort to name calling, nothing's gonna get done. How many of you have had issues with shortages, right? Okay, of course. Uh, no matter what uh, branch of the media you watch, uh, there are drug shortages pretty much everywhere. Um, we are at one of the highest drug shortages in the last uh, 10 years. We are just peaking on that right now. Uh, the reason is multifactorial. This has come from the US Drug Administration. Quality, manufacturing delays, manufacturing issues, lack of raw materials, loss of the manufacturing site, and, and increased demand for drugs as well. Um, my brother actually used to work for a generic stimulant making company and one of the major issues with these stimulant making companies is it is sometimes very difficult to get the raw materials to to produce this uh, these medications and apparently the margins on generic drugs are so small sometimes it's worth it for them not to actually make that medication that day it's better to make something where they can make more of a profit which is unfortunate for patients who require drugs that are cheaper um, the only person who can fix medication shortages is you 
Your doctor cannot fix your medication shortage. If you have a problem with your medications or there are shortages, you must, you must tell your elected officials. This is a QR code for you to take a look at and scan and tell your elected officials that there are problems with your medications. Your elected officials will care if you tell them. They will not care if they see it in the news. They will not care if um, there's just one person who tells them. But by telling them en masse, they will address it. That's what your elected officials are for. Outside the office, how to fix the, how to fix a problem, maintain a routine schedule, set up your wake time, adjust your bedtime accordingly. That's probably one of the best pieces of advice that we give most sleep patients. Understand your naps, understand your duration, understand the timing of your naps so you can understand when to take your medications. Finding activities or work that fit your healthcare schedule. Many times work will allow patients to uh, work in the middle of the day and then uh, work again at night and take long breaks in between. Finding a job that is, uh, works for you is the best way to go. And don't be afraid to ask for help from good friends or family. When I was in college, I had a lot of sleep deprivation and my roommate would literally walk across campus and wake me up from the library and take me to class and I asked him to, this was before I had good alarm clocks on your cell phones and things like that. My little Casio watch was not able to keep me awake. Uh, so I had a roommate help, uh, help by waking me up and it was really not a big deal. So those of you who feel alone and you feel isolated uh, because of your sleepiness, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. Otherwise you will feel more and more isolated. There are support groups and resources. I'm a bit preaching to the choir here. Hypersomnia Foundation, uh, the National Sleep Foundation, there's Wake Up Narcolepsy, and social media groups have pros and cons. A lot of times patients are happy to be on social media. Uh, I've had a couple of my patients leave some social media groups because they've been too negative, and if that's the case, you shouldn't be in an environment that is negative. Remember, your sleep is part of your sanctuary. If there's a lot of negativity to it, that in itself will worsen your sleep. So make sure to be in a nurturing environment when it comes to that, whether it is online or in the home. Taking care of your non-sleep issues as well. Ask yourself, ask your primary care physician, am I taking too many medications? We get this question a lot. It is always good to ask, but if you have reasons for them, it is okay. The, just like a diabetic who has uh, problems with their sugars, they may need to take multiple medications for their diabetes. Uh, you may need to take multiple medications for your um, disease as well. Narcolepsy patients specifically have been shown to have higher levels of anxiety, higher levels of depression. Similar studies have been done in hypersomnia patients. Narcoleptics are more likely to have heart disease. Narcoleptics are more likely to have stroke in the future at slightly higher risk compared to the general population. This is why it's so important to exercise and take care of your health. You are not just one disease. And finally, we did hear a little bit about today to get involved with clinical trials. This is one of the most important things that you can do for the future of medicine, for the future of patients uh, coming out there. Uh, I looked uh, online and I did a, just a quick search on clinicaltrials.gov. There are currently 29 studies going on for idiopathic hypersomnia, and there are currently 25 studies going on for narcolepsy. So not all trials are meant for every single person and every single situation, but if you look online, you might find a trial uh, that is right for you. If you can only ask one question, what is that question? Do not ask your doctor, doctor, if you were me, what would you do in this situation? The reason you don't ask that question is I already told you, your doctor is more neurotic than you and has way different uh, personality traits. The better question to ask is, doctor, if you were my uh, sister, doctor, if, you, if I were your mother, doctor, if I were your aunt, what would you do in this situation? Have the doctor think about you as a family member and not as themselves. Doctors often don't treat themselves right anyway. So have your doctor treat, think of you as a family member when they ask this question. So doctor, if I were your or if you were my, whatever your relationship could possibly be, that's a way better question than asking, what would you do if you were me? You'll get like a quick three second response, take this medication and be done. So you wanna ask, you wanna frame yourself as a relation to the doctor as opposed to the doctor themselves. So that's my dad, it's not all, it's not all doom and gloom, I totally promise, uh, and uh, thank you guys very much. <laughs> all right, thank you, Dr. Corey. And with that, um, let's open up to everyone here and online. If you have questions, please put them in the chat or raise your hand. And we'd gladly um, put your question to Dr. Corey. Yes, ma'am. 
Could you go back to the the slides where you had the medical history or yeah, like the sure. thing that you bring to your doctor? Yes, this is so, this will, uh, absolutely. I think it was kind of, oh, here we go. go, this is there it, right go. here. Okay. This is, this is, this is what your medical record is built upon. Go ahead, take pictures, please. Definitely. This is what your medical record is built upon. Uh, these are the things that go into your electronic medical record system. These are the things that kind of carry throughout. If you can get through this in under five minutes, you will have a great visit with your doctor. You'll be able to tell them your problems. You'll be able to tell them what exactly is wrong. But if this takes half your visit, then you've wasted or you've lost a lot of time. You want to get through all this background quickly so you can get to the active problem at hand. So bringing this in a list format is great. I have had one patient who literally wrote me like a three or four page essay as to what was going on and when. And it was very beautifully written. But if every patient did that, I would never be able to get through the rest of my day. Um, so bringing things in list format, medications, past medications is so important. I, I can't stress that one enough. Why? Your doctor doesn't want to reinvent the wheel. Your doctor doesn't want to put you on something that may not have worked a few years ago. And it is true that medication you may have been on in the past may be okay to try now, but you're, you need to know that up front that this is a second trial of a certain medication. Your doctor doesn't want to be surprised about that up front. Um, if you have taken meds previous, and, and I especially ask for patients who have a history of depression, anxiety, things like that, who may have been on multiple antidepressant medications, we like to know about those as well. Anything that affects the, uh, the mood, uh, uh, neuro neuro neurologic access, things like that, we want to know about that in the past and why you were on those. So th that's, that's the primary reason why. Um, some of those meds that you might have been on in the past may have made your sleepiness worse and may have made some of your current medications less active. So we want to know why, why that's the case. You mentioned having um, a solid relationship with your primary care physician. Yeah. Um, I have a 16-year-old son who I'm fairly sure has hypersomnia. Sure. Um, she didn't know what hypersomnia was, didn't suspect a sleep disorder, and he's been to three sleep doctors um, in our hometown that all have just been like, he's lazy, he's depressed, oh. he's whatever. Yeah. So can you speak a little bit about like how we can advocate for what yeah, what happens when you don't get what happens when you don't get the care that, that you're looking for? And you are correct. When it comes to rare disorders, uh, uh, and not just for hypersomnia and narcolepsy, we see this with multiple sclerosis as well. Um, many patients, especially pediatricians, may not be well versed in that. And so it's good to have a good relationship with your primary care doctor, but you, are, you do need a specialist for this. Now, you've, you've been in a situation where you've been to three specialists so far, at least multiple specialists. You want to make sure that your uh, son has done the polysomnogram and MSLT. You want to make sure your son has given them, uh, uh, what do I want to say, uh, sleep diaries and things like that. Um, I can talk to you specifically afterwards if you want, if we can maybe talk strategy for your son specifically. Um, but those are some of the big things you want to do. You've already sought three opinions, and, and a fourth one obviously may or may not be different for you. Um, going back to the same physician over and over again actually may be a better strategy than not. So a lot of times patients will jump from one physician to the next, one or two visits here, one or two visits here. I think it's important sometimes to stick with the physician uh, and show them the problems that your son may be having, the, the, the more, you know, maybe one of the more caring of the three. Multiple visits for the same problem and realizing like, my kid, this, my kid is sick. You see it because you see them every day. Your uh, doctor may not have seen it those first two times. So multiple visits may actually be helpful and maybe we can talk afterwards to see if I can help you out. Um, but multiple visits to a specific physician may be helpful. So if, they, if your doctor missed it the first time or second time, doing, going back and saying, there is a problem, there is a problem. And this is actually very common in medicine where a physician may make a decision and then they are stuck with it for a little bit of time and they need to see more in order to get their mind changed. So sometimes, although, yes, second opinion is very important, going back to the, the same doctor or going back after it, it's been a year, doctor, and things are not good. He is still bad. We've seen two other doctors and, and things are worse than they were a year ago. So that might be another strategy to try, going back to someone who maybe you liked or disliked but just missed the diagnosis. It might be another way to try it. Thank you. We have an online question, which is how often should 
um, someone have a sleep study. Um, one of our attendees had the last sleep study in 2019 and is curious how often, what's there, the frequency? Yeah, there's not a reason for an annual sleep study or a sleep study every so often. If you have one sleep study and you have made the diagnosis of narcolepsy or hypersomnia, that's really all you need. Now, there is maybe a situation, or there was more so in the past, where somebody was diagnosed with hypersomnia and we thought, well, maybe they have narcolepsy and we'll want to repeat the study to see if we can catch uh, the, the sleep stages of narcolepsy. That's being done less now because there's a lot more medication overlap than there was in the past, but there's no reason to have repeated sleep studies unless you have not been able to get a diagnosis because you're, you can have a negative sleep study the first time or even the second time, and you're trying to get a diagnosis. So repeat sleep study. If you have the diagnosis, it's unnecessary. But if you're trying to make a diagnosis of hypersom, you're trying to make a diagnosis of narcolepsy, a repeat sleep study would be important. Okay, thank you. And another one here, is there a specific sleep diary model that you would recommend? Uh, I don't particularly recommend one other than I like, I personally like the sleep diaries that start at six or seven o'clock in the evening and then go 24 hours from them. There's, there's some sleep diaries that start at 8 a.m. A lot of patients are sleeping into 8 a.m. And the way you look at a diary uh, online or on a, on a form, we'd like to see nice big bars in, in, the, in the beginning of the night. So I usually like, like to look at diaries that start at 6 p.m. and go 24 hours starting in the evening. But it's, there's not a specific one. Many doctor's offices, many sleep practices will give you a specific diary that they like filled out. And that's probably the best one to use because that's the one your doctor is most familiar with looking at. Okay. ASM. So they hey, Sam has that one. Yeah, so sleepeducation.org, and there's a two-week sleep diary that starts at noon. But Perfect. at least yeah. the evening yeah. time yeah. until Noon's the morning. Great. Noon's yeah. great, absolutely. So it, Noon and is great. it gives instructions on how to utilize it as well. So this one is a really nice PDF that you can print out and you can utilize. Um, and the other piece to just add to what John is saying is that you can also always complement this with if you are wearing a wearable that tracks your sleep. Um, for the mom who was asking the question, that's mm. another piece of data that if they're not believing you and you give them a sleep diary and they're going, well, you made this up, if they're wearing a wearable, that that can also be other objective data that shows that they're sleeping too much. Yeah, and, and although wearable, one of the best things with wearables is time falling asleep and time waking up in the morning. A lot of stuff in the middle, there's, there's yeah. some debate on, but falling asleep and waking up time, if you get pushback on wearables, wearables are, pretty accurate at when you fall asleep and when you wake up, the, end, yeah. the, the two endpoints. Yeah. Uh, and that's the most important thing when you're talking to a clinician about how long somebody is sleeping for, why aren't they functioning well at school. So hi, Dr. Corey, I'm a, I'm a 17. Um, a when, we talk, <laughs> when, we, when we talk about the Epworth, I, yeah. know I heard some comments about this earlier about, I hate that thing. Yeah, and, I know. and I can speak I personally, I do. Yeah. Um, but any guidance on how to like even answer the questions, right? Like Honestly. sitting quietly <laughs> after lunch without alcohol, yeah. are you a zero or a four or whatever? It's, it like, it, it we... is probably one of them. I get it all the time from every single patient. Do I have to do this? It's a little bit of a framework and it's used in clinical trials a lot. And it, it's, you know, there are better things out there, but it's so pervasive. It's a, like you said, I'm a 17. It's a very quick way. If you're, you're not a 12 and you're not a three, it's a very quick, rough way for your doctor to know what ballpark you're in right when you walk in the door. So it helps frame the, the, the questions. I have many patients who are five or six and still say that they're very sleepy during the day because they don't quite fit those, those questions. And that's okay. Um, but you have to just just do it as honest as you can. Take 30 seconds uh, in, in the visit. But yeah, it, it's it's what we have. It's what we've had for, for forever. Hi, thank you for today. Um, I wanted to know how you feel about this. So my daughter's very sleepy, and she's an international student. So it's really hard for her to advocate for herself yeah. sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then we also have issues with uh, doctor's offices just not returning messages in the portal or phone calls, et cetera. And so we ended up, she signed, or I have medical POA now, mm -hmm. so I can sort of help her advocate for herself when mm -hmm. she's unable to. And then it also allows me to talk to her physicians here in the United States if she can't. Yep. And I'm just wondering how do physicians feel about like a mom 
you know, with medical POA, helping their 22-year-old daughter who's, you know, I, sleepy. Well, well as I, I think it shows that there's some disability there. Uh, and obviously, your, your daughter is outside of the country, it sounds like, right? And so it's very difficult uh, to, to um, address that. My, I, I have had mom, I, I, it's interesting, your, your story reminds me of uh, a mom who came in, her son was, had insomnia, a little bit different, but she would come to the visit and we would zoom in for the visit to his, his college dorm. Uh, and then the three of us were there talking. Uh, and that sounds pretty similar. So I don't think that tends to be an issue. And in fact, now with new medical billing, this is probably a little bit of a mentality change. Old medical billing, the, the patient had to be there and be in the room. With new medical billing, if you are there, you can actually be seen on behalf of the patient. Not a lot of people know this. Um, you can, so you can, the doctor can bill your daughter for counseling you. That was not the case prior to 2020-ish. You can now bill for non-face-to-face -face time. Before, you could only bill for face-to-face -face time. So if your, doctor, if your daughter zoomed in for a minute and the, the doctor spends the next 30 minutes with you, that all counts as part of the visit. Uh, and that's all counts as now called coordination of care. So this will be, depend on your doctor's risk and your hospital's policy. So unfortunately, after the pan as the pandemic has now ended, many states have now started to regulate um, telemedicine, that you can't do telemedicine out of state. Patient must be in the state that you're in. However, there aren't rules for international. Part of the reason for the state rules is if you, if you sue your doctor, you have to sue your doctor in the state that, that you are, you're seeing him in. So if I see a person in New Jersey and I'm in Pennsylvania via telemedicine, theoretically that Jersey patient could sue me in New Jersey because I harmed him or, she, or her in New Jersey. Now your daughter in Spain or wherever she is cannot sue your doctor you know, from across the world. She's gotta sue them in the state. So they, you might need to go through the legal department for that kind of international aspect. I personally don't have a problem seeing patients like that. Your doctor might, that's gonna be a little bit individual on that. Um, have they made a relationship? Do your do do daughter already have a relationship with your doctor? With her doctor, sorry? Or is this kind of a new start? Um, well, she's here, she's in the country right now, thank God, okay. Uh, it's, it's been a rocky relationship the whole time and it's, I think it's just because the doctor's very busy and I yeah. don't, it's, it's it, is it is difficult, and the, yeah. the, the answer to very busy, by the way, which uh, I feel, I do feel it all the time, is to make more appointments. Um, the reason is your doctor is busy because he is crammed with, he or she is crammed with appointments. Uh, the answer to my doctor is very busy is to make more appointments because then you're, you're taking more time and you're getting more, you're getting more time in. So that's what I talked about earlier about making earlier appointments. Mm -hmm. Get more frequent appointments so you can address issues that you don't feel like you have to call because you won't be able to make the doctor less busy. You won't be able to make the office staff call you back sooner. But if you are physically there in the office because your problem requires you to have more frequent visits once a month, something like that, doctor, can I see you once a month for the next three months just until we've settled X? Then that's the answer to the visit because I, 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 can tr I can tell you now, uh, my hospital system recently cut out its overtime. Uh, so all the secretaries and things like that, if the, if the phones aren't addressed by five or whatever it is they have to check out, they have to check out. So there's been a lot of compression uh, after the pandemic when it comes to staffing. So, and I'm afraid actually that's something we might see more of in the future, um, more reduced staffing for yeah, clinics in general. So the answer to less, the answer to my doctor won't call me back is more appointments. Can, can you ask for a longer appointment? Um, you can, it uh, depends on your electronic medical record. If it's doable or not, you certainly can. Your doctor may or may not, may not let that go. That's a, that's a, that's a great ask too.